This command installs a persistent rootkit to a target machine. Once it is activated, it will connect back to the attacker IP. In this video, I will show you a tool that automates the persistence and backdoor installation to a target Linux machine. This is Panix, which is a Linux persistence tool. This tool is highly customizable and there are a lot of different methods included. But what do we mean by Linux persistence? It is a mechanism for an attacker to maintain access to the compromised system. This means an attacker must already have gained access to the target and most of the time already escalated to root user. The goal of persistence is to ensure attacker can gain access again easily without re-exploiting the system. Examples of these methods would be creating a job that will connect back to the attacker IP, or maybe adding the attacker public key to the authorized keys of root user on the target machine, or just creating backdoor users. There are also advanced methods to avoid detection, such as manipulating desktop settings, installing a rootkit on kernel level to increase stealth and evade detection tools, or manipulating the authentication modules so you can log in as root using any password you want. Let's try some basic examples. We can create a backdoor for a system user. Let's pick default to let Panix choose for us. This is an SSH backdoor, so we need to specify our public key. Let's analyze what happened. It picked the user news. I'm not sure the capabilities and permissions of this user, but we can always specify the user we want to backdoor. Typically, the shell of system users like this one is set to no login. That prevents any user, including root, to access that particular user. So it tried to add no login to the list of valid shells. After that, it also copied bin dash to sbin no login to make sure we can log into this user. And finally, it also updated the past WD file. Now, if we try to log into that user over SSH, we should be able to access the account. As we see here, news user doesn't have any special privileges. But as I mentioned, we can always change this to something else. We can do that by specifying the dash dash custom flag. A good OPSEC practice is to clean up things if no longer needed. This avoid detection and possible traces inside the compromised machine. In this case, if an attacker is done with the machine, he can remove the back door by using the dash dash revert flag and followed by the module name. It removed the .ssh directory for news user and reverted the no login shell. To verify that the backdoor was removed, we should no longer be able to access news user. The previous example is a very common technique that can be easily detected. Now let's try something unique and less common, which is to add persistence using system D generators. Generators are system D units that are run on the early parts of the boot process. An example legitimate use case will be to detect the presence of a USB device. If a USB device is detected on boot, system D generators can dynamically create a system D service to mount it. This can be abused as a persistence method by triggering a reverse shell connection whenever the target machine boots up. The exec start is pointed to a malicious script that will perform the connection to the attacker. Now, let's try to reboot. We will wait for a few minutes and once the machine comes up, we should expect a call back inside our attacker machine. We got a hit. If we interact with the session, we see that we are successfully connected to the target machine. System D generators are often overlooked, so this is a good hiding spot for attacker persistence. Another advanced way to perform persistence is by abusing the Linux UDEV system. UDEV is used for dynamic device management. This means it reacts to device events it receives from the kernel. The behavior is defined under a set of rules. These rules can be dropped in various directories such as etcudevrules.d. In Panix, we can add UDEV persistence using this format. We specify the module name as UDEV and using default technique, which is to trigger a reverse shell connection. So we need to provide also the attacker IP import. And finally, we add the cron parameter at the end. If we run this, it doesn't give us much information, but I will explain what happened. A rule has been created under this path. The subsystem indicates to watch any changes on network devices, but it should not include the loopback device. Once it receives changes, such as when an interface is added to the system, it will execute the following command that creates a cron that runs every minute. The command that the cron is executing is a reverse shell script. Question is, why do we need to put this inside a cron rather than just putting the reverse shell payload directly? One reason would be because there are some limitations for the run key. Programs that access the network or the file systems are not allowed inside the UDEV rules. That is because there is a sandbox enforced. I think this is also to avoid chicken and egg scenario where the network device is not yet active, but some script or command is trying to use it already. So this means there is a high chance that if we put reverse shell commands such as netcat, it will fail and break the persistence. So to work around that, 
we let a cron job to launch the command for us. This method is very useful in advanced tactics, such as waiting for a network device to come up. If, for example, if a target machine is dual-homed, meaning it is attached to two different networks, an attacker might wait for the second network interface to come up. Once that interface is up, the attacker can perform a specialized attack against that network. In order to simulate an interface being added to the system, we will use the udev adm command. From here, we successfully received the callback. Do note that the type of commands or actions we specify is not only about reverse shells. It can be using other commands such as regularly clearing out log files to avoid traces or making sure a C2 implant is always restarted during failures. There are a lot of different ways an attacker can abuse various OS functionalities to add persistence. Some of the common techniques would be setting capabilities on different binaries in the machine, abusing version control software such as adding pre-commit hooks which is very effective for highly used development environments or attackers can also put it on places where it is harder to remove, such as the bootloader. Another interesting method is to use a kernel-level rootkit, which is the one you saw from the first few seconds of the video. I decided to tackle rootkits on a separate video, so I didn't include the full details here. But in general, an LKM stands for Loadable Kernel Module. This is just like drivers in Windows, which can be abused by attackers not only for persistence, but also for modifying default OS behavior, such as hiding certain files. Since this is injected in the kernel space, it is harder to detect compared to other types of persistence. I think Panix is not only a great tool for automating persistence, but it also gives us idea on the different techniques and methods used by attackers. Just by reading the code, we gain knowledge on the different places where attackers can put their persistence. This also allows us to create better tools for detection. I hope you learned something today. If you find my content valuable, please support me by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. See you on the next one.